Standard 11 is economic geography, patterns and networks of economic interdependence on Earth's surface. Resources are unevenly scattered across the surface of the Earth, and no country has all the resources it needs to survive and grow. A person who is well informed geographically understands the spatial arrangement or organization of economic, transportations, and communication systems. These systems produce and exchange commodities such as raw materials, manufactured goods, capital, and services, all of which constitute the global economy. In this slide there are four images. The map in the upper left corner is a map of soil types in the United States. Soil, like water, is a natural resource. The U.S. has some fast, fantastic soil types for growing crops. The Midwestern and Prairie states have long been established as the breadbasket of the country. The map in the upper right corner shows the U.S.'s availability of renewable energy resources, from wind to biomass to solar energy. Again, the United States has abundant renewable energy potential. The photo in the bottom left is an open pit mine in Bisbee, Arizona, the Lavender Mine. This copper mine is what gave the town of Bisbee its economic jump start. Later, however, when the mine's output declined, Bisbee had to look elsewhere for its economic vitality. Today it is a quaint and quirky and artsy town in Arizona's high desert. And the photo in the bottom right is a picture of a Wisconsin forest. Logging was the economic engine of Wisconsin in its early days of European settlement. Today, cities and towns in Wisconsin have to rely on other industries and services to fuel their economies. The planet is truly economically interdependent. Each country must trade with others, and Earth is a world of increasingly global economic independence. The image in the top of this slide shows global shipping routes. You can see from the color of each line moving from black into reds, oranges, and then yellows the number of journeys taken on a particular route. The lower right hand corner shows the representatives to the Seoul Summit in November 2010 whose, finding, whose findings created the document called Framework for Strong, Sustainable, and Balanced Growth. The first five points from the introduction to the summit agreement read as follows. We, the leaders of the G20, are united in our conviction that by working together we can secure a more prosperous future for the citizens of all countries. When we first gathered in November 2008 to address the most severe world recession our generation has ever confronted, we pledged to support and stabilize the global economy, and at the same time, to lay the foundation for reform, to ensure the world would never face such upheaval again. Over the past four summits, we have worked with unprecedented cooperation to break the dramatic fall in the global economy to establish the basis for recovery and renewed growth. The concrete steps we have taken will happen, help ensure we are better prepared to prevent and, if necessary, to withstand future crises. We pledge to continue our coordinated efforts and act together to generate strong, sustainable, and balanced growth. We recognize the importance of addressing the corners of the most, the concerns of the most vulner vulnerable. To this end, we are determined to put jobs at the heart of the recovery, to provide social protection, decent work, and also to ensure accelerated growth in low-income countries. One of the main interests of geographers is to look for patterns and connections on Earth's surface. Geographers think spatially. Studying and mapping interconnections between phenomena is a major pursuit of geographers. We know that Earth's resources are unevenly distributed across the globe. For example, there is little oil in India and a lot of oil in the Middle East. Some world climates are suitable for year-round agriculture, and some places can only plant and harvest crops in a three or four month summer season. As a result, systems and networks of trade and transportation 
communication, and of course the crops, minerals, products, materials, components, labor, capital, and so much more move around in the system. In the images on this slide we see, in the bottom left corner, a map of railways in the United States. Note where you see the majority of rail, of rail lines originate around the Great Lakes, which is connected to the St. Lawrence Seaway, which is connected to the Atlantic Ocean, which leads us to both natural and manufactured resources abroad, as well as to markets for goods shipped from the United States. In the photo on the right side of the slide, we see the narrow gauge rail cars filled with iron ore from Ohio waiting to be put on ships or rails headed for some other part of the country. The spatial dimensions of economic and global interdependence are visible everywhere. Vegetables are shipped to markets miles from where they were grown and processed. In this slide we see four images. In the top left we see U.S. truck routes showing the vast network of high highways used to transport produce and goods from one place to another. We can envision mature crops in the field, the pickers, and the trucks trucks used to haul fresh vegetables to canning plants or to grocery distributing centers, which in turn send trucks to smaller regional distributing centers, and those centers load trucks destined for grocery stores, and then we go shopping and bring the produce home to our tables. In the upper right hand corner, a diagram showing the increase in U.S. corn production between 1957 and 2007. In the bottom left, we see a diagram that asks us to think about how, how far our produce travels before it reaches our supermarket. Look at the labels in grocery stores and you'll see products sold, and sold typically come from other U.S. states and from other countries. We might say, so what? Why should I care where my products come, come from as long as I can have fresh strawberry, strawberries whenever I want them? Why should we care? What might geographers consider? The number of miles the vegetables or other goods are moved, and the gas prices, and then the extraction and transportation of petroleum, and perhaps the conflict in oil-rich regions of the planet. And then we might consider the wear and tear on the roads, and the cost of maintaining roads with heavy truck traffic, and the cost of tires and maintaining the trucks, and the extraction of the rubber, and the natural goods and resources that go into transporting the crops or other goods. And finally, we see the cover of a book by writer Barbara Kingsolver, Animal, Vegetable, Miracle. This is a book about locally grown produce, an environmental, environmental counter trend to buying produce that is shipped across the country. It's fresher, so it's higher in nutrient value, and often grown with non-industrial strength pesticides or grown organically. And overall, eating locally grown produce means a lower carbon footprint. All we need to do is look around and we'll see these interconnections and networks visible everywhere. From a mail truck delivering and picking up mail in neighborhoods that retrieves its mail from the local post office, which retrieves its mail from the main post office distri distributing center in the city or region, which receives its mail from the airport, and so on and back and forth to your mailbox. To get an idea of where the products you use and the clothes you wear come from, check the labels on products. Are they made in the United States or are they made elsewhere? Create a map of the root of your skirt or your shirt that you're wearing today or the bath towels that you used this morning to see the journey of a particular item and how it might have arrived to your house. The globalized world in which we live adds even more layers of complexity to our connected and interconnected space. We looked at the hierarchy of places and almost the spokes that move outward from major distribution areas to smaller and smaller centers of business and trade. 
The map in the upper left-hand corner of this slide is a map of U.S. airline hubs. As the word suggests, hubs are located in the largest cities with the greatest demand for airline flights, and then they fly to outlying smaller cities. The exchange of goods and materials from one place to another keeps an economy running. The map on the right side of this slide shows a concentric circle map focused on Muncie, Indiana. It is showing the regional connections or the range or extent of the regional economy. Muncie and Delaware County are within 300 miles of cities like Chicago, Milwaukee, Detroit, Toledo, Columbus, Dayton, Cincinnati, Louisville, St. Louis, and of course Indianapolis. With multiple rail lines and close interstate routes nearby, Muncie in Delaware County offers easy access to transportation infrastructure. Economic activities depend upon capital, resources, power supplies, labor, information, and land. However, we also see that the spatial patterns of the labor systems change over time. For example, the advertisement at the bottom left of this slide illustrates that as people become more environmentally aware and as technology and connectivity improves, telecommunications are diminishing the need for a person's physical presence in an office. People are beginning to work more often from home. Economic, social, and therefore spatial relationships change continuously. And because trade and commerce depend upon capital, resources, power supplies, labor, information, and land, you can imagine the complex layering of networks, not only of transportation, but also communication and of people as well. Imagine the number of people and places and trucks, trains, airplanes, and telecommunications and other linkages that have gone into the dinner you eat tonight or the clothing you might wear tomorrow. Over the centuries, patterns of industrial labor systems have changed tremendously. In the mid and late 1800s in the United States, as factories concentrated in cities and machines replaced small-scale agriculturalists, people were pushed out of rural areas and pulled into the urban areas. Cities grew and so did their labor forces and overall composition. The book, whose cover you see on this slide, The Promised Land, The Great Black Migration and How It Changed America, tells the story of the largest internal migration in the history of the United States. When large southern plantations began to industrialize, industrialize fewer workers were needed as labor. At the same time, the northern industrial cities had job openings everywhere. Millions of African Americans from the South found themselves displaced from the farms and fields, so they migrated north where the jobs were. In this example, we see both push and pull factors at work, as people were at once pushed off the farms and pulled or attracted to the cities where jobs were plentiful. From a social standpoint, after the 1960s, more and more women began to work outside the home thereby altering the gender of commerce and trade as well. In the picture on this slide, we see two co-eds at Duke University in the 1960s. Women were beginning to participate in the paid workforce in ever-increasing increasing numbers. In the United States, the spatial structure and built environment revolving around trade and commerce shifted again after the 1980s. Factories and manufacturing plants are nearly gone, and the regions of the United States that grew out of the Industrial Revolution, the Great Lakes region and the manufacturing region, have declined in economic importance. The manufacturing belt is now often referred to as the Rust Belt. In the photo in the bottom right corner, we see Mexican women working in a maquiladora an assembly plant or factory outside of the United States, often along the border, but also as far away as China, India, and Indonesia. 
Maquiladoras are often referred to as sweatshops and are not known for their great working conditions. Yet they supply jobs for thousands and thousands of Mexican women. So again we see that economic, social, and thus spatial relationships change continuously. In the developed countries of the world's core areas, city, state, and regional planners and business leaders are concerned with such issues as accessibility, connectivity, location, networks, functional regions, and spatial efficiency, factors that play an essential, ro essential role in economic development and also reflect the spatial and economic interdependence of places on Earth. The image on this slide shows the state of Oregon's schematic diagram for transportation planning, integration, and implementation. As the diagram's flow illustrates, the Transportation Department is not only concerned with cars and trucks, but other modes of transportation as well, such as public modes of transportation, bicycles and pedestrian traffic, rail and freight lines, and so on. After passing through several phases of planning and refining, the Comprehensive Transportation Plan moves toward implementation. As world population grows, as energy costs increase, as time becomes more valuable, and as resources become depleted or discovered, societies need economic system, systems that are more efficient and re more responsive. It is particularly important, therefore, for students to understand world patterns and networks of economic interdependence and to realize that traditional patterns of trade, human migration, and cultural and political alliances are being altered as a consequence of global interdependence. This presentation is by Beth Larson, School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning, Arizona State University, 2011.